Mr. Donor has uh, donated this TV for us. You know who you are. Thank you for that. Excellent. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, I feel like already this morning we have had a feast, an uh, absolute uh, feast of reflecting on God's Word and, and absorbing it uh, as we sing, as we've um, thought about the pathway, listen to the backers. Um, what a blessing to be here. Uh, and now we come to God's Word to, to open it and um, think together how we can apply this part of the Bible to our lives. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, Joshua chapter 2. Um, Paul has prayed for us, so I'm going to dive straight in. Uh, we're going to read Joshua chapter 2, but we're taking in a larger chunk this morning. We're kind of taking in a section from chapter 2 to chapter 4. Um, so I'm going to read chapter 2 and then just a little bit at the end of chapter 4. Uh, so this is Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go. Look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I do, did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them, that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. Uh, if you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. Now the man had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. If, if, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on, your, on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went to the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything 
that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. That's chapter 2 now. Across to chapter 4, we'll pick it up from verse 15. Uh, God's people have come to the Jordan River, and uh, this is kind of the, the tail end of them having crossed it. Uh, Verse 15, then the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant Law to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And the priests came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Uh, Well, in December 2015, um, in a speech against terrorism, Barack Obama uh, said the following. He said, my fellow Americans, I am confident that we will succeed in this mission because we are on the right side of history. It's an interesting expression, that, isn't it? The, the, The right side of history. What does it mean to be on the right side of history or, in fact, on the wrong side? Um... Because it is this idea that it's, it's found its way into popular imagination. A kind of a way of saying, my thing is definitely right, and in time, everyone is going to agree with me. And I think what it does is it, it taps into this fear that we have, this, this, this sense that uh, sometime in the future, people will look back at us and think that we're stupid or think that we're immoral or evil or something. Um, Kind of like sometimes we look back in the past and look at something like the slave trade and we think, oh, you know, how could they? You know, so evil. That we worry that people in the future will look back and think the same thing of us and judge us. And we don't want to be on the wrong side of history. We we want to be be right. Um, It's probably worth saying just, just quickly, like, it's not a very good argument. Just, just because people in the future think something um, doesn't necessarily make it right or wrong. They might have things wrong in the future. But I think it, in the present, it still feels compelling to have someone say, history will judge us and that we will have backed the wrong horse. Well, here in Joshua chapter 2, um, we come to a decisive point in ancient history. And we meet some people who need to work out where history is going and which side is going to be the right side of history or the wrong side. And what we see is a demonstration of God's power that means that even before a single sword is drawn in battle, we know exactly where history is heading. So we're going to dig into this uh, little chunk of Joshua. We're going to pick up the story of Rahab first. And then we're going to look at this account of Israel crossing the Jordan River into Canaan. And in different ways, both stories are about the power of God. And what we're going to see is how God displays his power so that we might respond with faith and remember with fear. Respond with faith, remember with fear. That's where we're going this morning. So firstly, in light of God's power, we are to respond with faith. Uh, We left off last week with Israel getting themselves ready to cross the Jordan and and go into the land. But we get to chapter 2, and it's almost like that part of the story hits pause, 
and we get this kind of like James Bond uh, spy story taking place uh, in chapter 2. Uh, you see what happens there in verse 1. Uh, Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. And all I want to say is that things get off to a bad start. A bad start. Uh, they're staying in a place called Shittim. Now, in the Bible, as you're reading through, uh, this is like a hot tip. Places matter. Uh, where they are really matters, and especially when it's named like this. And so the question to ask is, when have they been here before? What, was the, what happened last time they were here? Well, uh, last week, if you remember, uh, we heard that Israel had come to the edge of uh, the, the land of Canaan before, and they'd sent spies in before uh, to explore the land, but the spies had brought a bad report back, and, and Israel had been too faithless to obey God and, and enter the land. And so God judged them for their faithlessness. And on that occasion, they were staying at a place called Shittim. And what happened there? Uh, well, let's see. This is Numbers 25. Uh, while Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women. And now we fast forward 40 years, and what happens? Joshua 1, uh, Joshua sends in the spies, and they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. And we are off to a very bad start. Uh, last time in Numbers 25, God punished them with a plague that killed 24,000 of them. And now we're here 40 years later, same place, and exactly the same thing happens. Israel are no different this time. Do not think that somehow God's people are better, more, more moral, that they're a good people or a great army or something. They are not. And yet this time, God is working things out differently. Uh, they've gone to a prostitute named Rahab, and she is different. She knows something. And so when the king of Jericho kind of puts the, the, the hard word on her, uh, she hides the spies, and she, she sends the, the secret police off in a, in a different direction. And here's the difference. Uh, look at what Rahab knows. Look at what she knows there in verse 8. Uh, her speech um, to the spies is kind of this... this crucial moment. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know, I know that the Lord has given you this land. She knows. I know that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. She says, look, I know where this is going. I know where history is heading. I can tell. We've heard what your God has done. She recounts, I've, I've heard about how your God brought you up out of Egypt through the dry ground across the Red Sea. I've heard what you've done to the, the kings on the other side of the Jordan, how you've completely defeated them. We've heard about all that. And so Rahab is putting all these things together. And look at how she finishes verse 11. She says, For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. That is what Rahab knows. And she knows that based on facts, things that have happened in history that tell her where the real power lies, that it lies with the God who is God above in heaven and on the earth below. And do you want to be on the right side of history? then align yourself with the God who is God of heaven above and the earth below. That is what Rahab would tell you to do. That's what Rahab thinks to herself. And that's what she does. Uh, let's read on. Uh, verse 12. She says, Now then, uh, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. She sees where history is heading, and she cuts a deal with the spies. Uh, 
She says, when, when God brings you here and when you win a victory, which you surely will, when that happens, please show kindness to me like I'm doing for you. She, she's putting herself on the right side of history, aligning herself with the real power, the living God. Uh, but do notice that she is turning her back on her people. It's worth just, just stopping to get a sense of how much she's risking here. She, she's basically turning traitor on her own people, rejecting their, their gods, rejecting her own culture, uh, walking her wa- away from her old life to put her lot in with God and God's people. And really, that is what it's like to become a Christian. To, it, it works like that. Turning your back on your old life, throwing yourself on the mercy of God, aligning yourself with Him. And that does feel risky. But I can tell you, if God is God, then it makes total sense. She takes what she knows about God and she responds with faith. She responds with faith. Rahab, uh, in many ways, is the picture of how to become a Christian. Uh, Regardless of who she is and what she's done, she responds with faith to the living God and seeks mercy and refuge in Him. Uh, That's what it means to become a Christian. But in the New Testament, uh, the New Testament actually thinks about Rahab slightly differently. Uh, The book of James uses Rahab as the example of faith that produces action. Faith that produces action. Faith that changes you and causes you to live differently. This is James chapter 2. What happens is James talks about Abraham to begin with and he says, you see that his faith, that is Abraham's faith, his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And then verse 25, in the same way, the same way as Abraham, was not Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Really amazing reflection on the Rahab story. This pagan prostitute was considered righteous. Why? Because she did that thing where you turn away from your old life and took action to put her lot in with God himself. Do you know the God who is God in heaven above and the earth below? We sang words to that effect this morning, didn't we? That is our God. And if that is your God, do do you line your faith up with action? Do you express the fact that you believe and know those things about God? Can I urge you this morning, get your life on the right side of history. Uh, Show in your actions the faith that you have. Uh, If I believe it's going to rain, I take my umbrella. If I uh, believe and and trust that the airline is safe, then I board the flight. And I want to say the same thing. If you believe that history will end with God establishing his eternal kingdom, then can I urge you to live for that kingdom now? Uh, There's lots of ways we could uh, put that into practice, uh, think through how we might apply that, uh, what it looks like to to have uh, actions that line up with our faith. But let's, this morning, take the lesson that somehow the Israelites failed to learn at Shittim. If God is God above in heaven and on the earth below, and if he calls us to respond in faith that produces action, then get rid of sexual immorality. Let's not make the same mistake as the Israelites who came back to the same place and did the same thing. Uh, Failed to listen and, and live out 
their life with God as they should. If you're someone who battles with pornography, can I say, keep fighting to put that to death. Keep working at that. Can I urge you to reach out to a Christian brother or sister for help? Let's line up our actions with what we believe and know about the living God. If you're tempted by what you watch or by uh, flirty relationships, can I say flee from sexual immorality? Let's not be like the Israelites. How do you respond to seeing God's power? Well, with faith like Rahab. Faith that sees where history is going and lines up with the God of the universe. That's part one, responding with faith. Part two is remembering with fear. We're to remember with fear. In chapter three, uh, what happens is we get back to the main storyline of, of Israel heading into the land. And we find again that Israel's past history is coming up over and over. This time, uh, these chapters take us back to Egypt, uh, the time when God led his people up out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, on dry ground. And here we are, we're in the same situation. Israel, uh, God's people are kind of amassed at the water's edge with this uh, stretch of water before them that they have no way of being able to cross. And again, God puts his power on display. We're even told in verse 15 that the Jordan is in flood stage at this time of year. And so it wouldn't have just been the regular river channel, it would have been that, but then also you have to imagine it kind of over the banks and and all the way out across the floodplain. It would have been this insurmountable barrier. And yet God works. Uh, All the same elements are there. Uh, He gives his instructions to his people. They carry the ark, and as the ark kind of uh, gets carried by the priest, as the priest's feet touch the water, God is going to dry up the river, and they're going to walk across Just like in the Exodus, God's power on display. And that happens. um, But then we get to chapter 4, and all of a sudden, God says, wait, stop. Go back into the river. Get 12 stones from the riverbed. Actually, this is kind of this whole chapter detailing this process of going and collecting uh, these stones. It's a memorial God wants them to remember his power on display at this moment. Now, you know that feeling um, when you see something that's kind of out of place. It's just in, in a weird location, like you're going on a hike out in the bush and there's just something odd, like there's a crab shell or something. You're like, how did this crab get here and die? Did it, did it crawl here? Did, did a bird fly? And just, it doesn't make any sense for it to be where it is. And that's the the idea with these stones, I think, Uh, these 12 big river stones. Joshua sets them up about 5Ks inland at a place called Gilgal. And you can imagine someone coming along uh, in 10, 20, 100 years' time and coming across this kind of pile of stones and thinking, that's so weird. Like, these, these are river stones. Where's the river? Like, how did they get here? And the reason is... So they'll remember. Uh, There in verse 20, uh, Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they'd taken out of the Jordan, and he said to the Israelites, In the future, when the descendants, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them. Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. See, again, it's a repeat of the rescue uh, out of Egypt, the the Red Sea incident. Uh, Again, a memorial to the power of God to keep his promises to his people. And so they are to teach their kids about it, talk about it, tell them about it. Do you also notice the implication, the the fact that God tells them to set up a memorial? It should be an indication that this is not something that's going to happen every day. This is not a 
um, an everyday occurrence. This is going to be something out of the ordinary. We don't build statues of every single footy player that ever plays. We only build statues of the best of the best, the exceptional ones. So we walk past them, we remember. And it's like this, this, this is a rare event. God is doing it now and they need to remember this moment. But notice why. Notice why God has done this. This is the key verse, I think, verse 24. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. That's the message he wants to send to the earth, that he is the powerful one for whom no barrier is insurmountable. And not just that, and so that you... Israel, you people of God, might always fear the Lord your God. God puts his power on display because he wants the world to know that he is the ultimate power of the universe. But he has a particular purpose for his people so that they might always fear him. I think we sometimes get confused by that expression and you know, what does it mean to, to, to fear God? Uh, we know that it means respect and, and honor, but it is kind of more than that. Uh, it does mean fear when we recognize God's power and get a sense of, of how much more He is and, and just the, the scope of that power compared to us. It, it does give us a right fear out of who he is. Um, have you ever been to a place called The Gap in Albany? We've got a picture here. Um, the, the name really explains what it is. It's essentially just a gap um, in the coastline so that the, the southern ocean kind of comes in between these two sheer cliffs. This is a photo taken from the other side and, and so there's this um, kind of hollow bit where the, the waves come in. And what they've done um, is they've built this cantilever uh, out over the edge of the gap so you can look down um, and you can see it goes 40 metres down to the, to the waves below. Uh, I went to the gap once during this wild storm and just like wind and rain just whipping in and the huge swells coming in off the Southern Ocean, crashing against here and just you feel the, the salty spray coming up and, and washing into our faces. And as I walked out across uh, this just kind of lookout area and, and through the steel mesh to, to look down at the waves beneath surging in, I did think to myself... Man, don't do anything stupid. <laughs> like this, this, is, this is real power. This is something, and obviously I was scared. This, this, the connection is I was, <laughs> there was real fear, right? Because this is, some, this is a power beyond me. There's, there's nothing I can do. This is a thing that can overpower me. And really, uh, that is the right kind of sense. Uh, respect, yes. Don't do anything stupid here. <laughs> but when you see real power, there is a, a right response of fear. And that's what God wants for his people, to know that he is completely different in power to them and to anything else. And so the right response is to fear him. And so I want to ask, is that how you think about God? How, how powerful do you think he is in your mind? I think a good measure of how powerful we think God is or how much we fear him is how we react when we face other fears or other powers. Like if your boss asks you to, you know, just fudge the numbers on next month's report and he wants you to do that, but, but God wouldn't want you to do that. Uh, who do you fear? Who will you listen to? Your boss or God? Now, that's, that's quite a stark example, isn't it? But often it's more subtle than that. 
Whose approval do you crave the most? Do you shape your life around wanting to please God in everything? Or do you shape your life around seeking the approval of others? Your friends, your parents. Who do you fear when those things clash? Or when the world tells you that holding uh, to the Christian faith or Christian ideas of morality will put you on the wrong side of history? Do you believe that? Who do you listen to? Who do you fear? Do you fear the opinion of people around you? Or do you fear the living God who rules all history by his power? For Israel, uh, setting up these stones, uh, remembering God's power, should lead them to fear the Lord above all else. And if that is true for Israel, who walked through the Jordan and had a pile of stones to remember it, how much more true should it be for us people who have seen God work the most incredible display of power in all history. When God sends his son, Jesus, to the cross, we see the ultimate display of God's power where he defeats sin and removes its consequences, where he defeats death itself where he defeats every spiritual power and saves his people from the gates of hell. When he displays his power like that at the cross, we have seen God work his mighty strength. And that is the measure of how powerful he is. And that he does it, not with a mighty army, but with the weakest, most shameful thing you could possibly imagine. That is how powerful he is, that he would use a nothing to achieve everything. Just this, this, this weak, vile execution to accomplish his mighty purposes. That is the power of our God. At the point of Jesus' execution, um, I'm sure his disciples thought, man, we are on the wrong side of history here. <laughs> we have backed the wrong horse. But in fact, God was showing the full extent of his power over what the world thinks of as powerful. And so if God's power is on display ultimately at the cross, then let's apply our lessons from Joshua and respond with faith and remember with fear. Let's respond with faith. Let's take Rahab as our example and put our faith into action. If Jesus has shown his power, then let's put ourselves on his side of history. Let's be gospel people, people who are on about the cross, that have the cross as our symbol of remembrance, the thing that we keep going back to, even when the world says that that is wrong. Because we know, we know that God's power rests there at the cross. And let's remember with fear. Let's teach our kids about it. That's what's happening behind this wall right now, uh, up at the youth. Let's be a people who teach our kids about the cross. The cross really is incredible. It is the moment where God displays the the full extent of his power, this ultimate display, and yet it is also the thing that rescues us. It's the thing before which we, we should rightly tremble in fear when we see what God has done and, and just how powerful he is at the cross. And yet it is also the thing that takes away our fear of judgment. So that we we fear God, but not as as though we can't approach him. Not fearful because we know that we will face his judgment. But confident, assured of his love for us. We must remember the cross. Put all our faith 
in it. And let the cross remind us to fear the Lord rightly and not to fear the things of this world. Let's pray. Let's pray for God's help. Loving Father, um, our minds can't even grasp the the full extent of your power. Uh, And yet we thank you, Father, that you have uh, shown us in the cross how able you are to achieve your purposes, to keep your promises, uh, even using the weakest of human means. And so we praise you, Father, and we pray this morning that you would help us to grasp more of your power so that we might rightly fear you, no longer fearing judgment because of the saving work of the cross, but rightly uh, fearing you for who you are, so much higher and bigger and stronger than we are, beyond anything that we can imagine. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to go from here, living lives of godly fear, uh, obedient to you, uh, faithful to you, Uh, seeking in all things uh, to live for your kingdom and your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.